Okay, so this morning I'm going to be starting a sourdough and I am going to be using a Levon because it got up a little bit later than I meant to. My starter has been living in the refrigerator for several days and my normal procedure is to take it out the night before I plan to use it and um, when I get up at stupid o'clock around 4.30 I'll feed it so that around 7 it's ready for me to use. I got up a little later this morning, so instead of feeding it and then hoping it's ready by 7, I'm going to make a Levon, which kind of jump starts the process. So I'm going to start by stirring it, just to make sure it's well combined. I'm going to take my third cup measure, get a third cup of the starter. and put it in a mug or something else that's um, going to keep it cozy. I'm used to using mugs for my for proofing my active dry yeast, so it's kind of a comfortable, familiar thing for me. Now I'm going to add a third cup of flour and then enough water to get it back to the consistency that I like. It's like a thick um, cake batter. It's a little bit thicker than cake batter, maybe. And it's a little bit lumpy, which is okay. I'm gonna store this for about an hour in my oven, which I turned to 100, warmed it up, and then turned it off. If your oven doesn't go to 100, you can just turn it on to whatever your lowest temperature is for a very brief time. Don't let it get fully to temperature, and then put it in there. And it's starting to bubble already. So I know it's active and eating its meal. So there it is, it's tucked in, and I'm just going to close this up and let it grow for a little while. Then I'm going to go ahead and feed my starter so that it can do its growing. And... Alright, and it's been about an hour and a half, which is a little longer than I meant to go. I got distracted, and that's, you know, the thing that happens. So here's my Levon, very happy, very um, lively, um, not quite overflowing. And I know that a lot of people are not sure when is my uh, starter ready to make uh, bread. Because if you're making it at the wrong point in its feeding and relaxing cycle, um, you'll end up with something that's less exciting than you're hoping for. So this, because it's got that um, rounded top, let's see if we can capture that. It's still rounded on the top. That means it's still growing. Um, once it starts to collapse, it's a little less ideal um, for baking with. Doesn't mean you can't bake with it, but this is the the uh, starter that I fed this morning. <clears throat> it's not quite as vibrant as my Levon, but also is nice and uh, rounded on the top. Still growing and expanding. That's a good point to use it. I have a starter that I'm reviving for somebody and this one has since collapsed. I fed it last night and it is collapsed and you can see that the bubbles are all popped, very open. Um, so it's a very different look, perhaps not, but maybe you can see the difference between the two. All right. Oh, another way to see if your starter is ripe, if you still can't quite tell. Take a little dollop of your starter, drop it in some water, and if it floats, before it dissolves and sinks, if it floats, then um, it is ripe and ready to use. If it sinks right away, it is not ready to use and needs some more time to grow. I'm just gonna pour this in. You see my starter is nice and thick. It's not 
super liquidy. I know that at this point, a lot of like the professionals and the um, experts on sourdough will say that you're actually supposed to mix your water and your flour together to let them um, autolyze. I think that's what it's called. Um, and um, I never do that and my bread turns out okay. But if that's a process that makes sense for you or if you're having trouble with your with your breads, so they're not turning out quite as you expect, that might be a step that you could add. So I always start with my starter and my water, or in this case, my Levon and my water. And I'm just gonna mix those up a little bit before I add anything else. All right. Now, if I were starting with the starter rather than a Levon, I would mix it up and I'd add a little flour and let it sit for a couple of minutes just to kind of help the starter, you know, get invigorated by its new meal. But because I started with the Levon, I'm just gonna go straight into my bread making. So I'm gonna add some flour and I don't measure this. I go by feel because sometimes for whatever reason, things are a little wetter or combine a little bit quicker and other times they don't. A lot of people just throw the salt in. Um, I like to make sure that the sourdough has interacted with some flour before I add the salt. This is a holdover from my days of, of working primarily with um, active dry yeast, which I try to avoid coming in direct contact with salt until it's started to grow. For this recipe, I'm using about a, a generous three-quarter teaspoon or a scant single teaspoon. Um, it's three-quarter cup water. Uh, the Levon I started with, which um, if I'm not using a Levon, it's about a generous third cup of starter. If I have extra starter that I just need to get used, I'll throw in half a cup. Mix that a little bit. Now I'm going to just throw in enough flour until I get the consistency that I want. So I want my dough to be a little damp, kind of tacky, not super all out sticky, because I'm going to want it to have enough flour to support the structure of the growth because I uh, let my dough rise just on a pizza peel. I don't use a, um, a basket or anything like that. Um, so my needs to have enough flour to support that structure. If it's too wet, it'll just kind of become a very large flatbread. So I want it to be tacky. So I'm sticking a little, but it's not like a long strand of stickiness stuck to me. Now, a lot of people will at this point throw it in a bowl and let it rise and go for, um, uh, every 30 minutes they'll do what's called stretch and fold which is sort of like a very gentle punch down where you with damp hands grab it and kind of stretch it out fold it over and repeat a couple times then let it sit for half an hour and people will go through it, um, three cycles of this the nice thing about doing stretch and fold is that you can feel the changes in the dough and you kind of get a better feel for the progress your dough is going through um, I generally actually need my my sourdough at this point uh, for a brief time uh, because I'm you know my hands don't always work right stretch and fold is not always something I can do uh, it also doesn't always fit in my schedule so if I find that if I need it at this stage I don't need to do the stretch and fold although sometimes I'll do it just to kind of check up on how my dough is growing so It's still kind of lumpy and that's okay. That's kind of expected at this point. It's not, you know, a smooth cohesive dough really yet. This is kind of pre-dough stage. I'm gonna put it in a lightly greased bowl for its rise. And one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of bread makers make, if they're, especially if they're transitioning from using active dry yeast to using sourdough, is they expect during that bulk rise, they're expecting their, um, 
dough to double in size and sourdough doesn't do that. That's an active dry yeast uh, trait. You're going to get much more oven spring out of sourdough than you get out of active dry yeast, but that initial rising isn't going to be that giant expansion that you get with um, active dry yeast. So I'm just going to put a little olive oil in here need to be a lot it just helps prevent sticking a lot of people don't do this they don't throw in olive oil they just deal with sticking and um, I think the stickiness of sourdough uh, dough can be really off-putting and difficult for people because they're not used to doughs being quite this tacky and sticky so the olive oil might be your friend here's my dough it's kind of shaggy a little lumpy and it's soft but you know, it's nothing to write home about and wouldn't do a whole lot if I threw it in the oven right now. I'm just gonna set this in and I'll cover it with a damp tea towel. A lot of people will use cling film. I try to avoid using anything that's disposable, so you're gonna find that I don't tend to use um, single-use parchment paper. I don't use cling film because um, I really don't need to and I don't wanna contribute to waste. Now if that's just something that you've decided works best for you, that's totally your call and I'm not going to judge you for that. But I like to use a damp tea towel. Um, this is a towel that has uh, isn't terry cloth so it's not going to stick to the bread so much. And I have a bajillion of these because I use them for all sorts of things. And I'm going to tuck it away in a nice spot where it's not going to get disturbed too much. Um, it's not like, you know, minor changes are going to affect it too much but we like to have it out of the way so it tends to live in our microwave that's my bread rising chamber um, sometimes I'll let it sit on the counter but it kind of depends on the warmth of the house and what else is going on I'm planning on doing some other baking today so um, I just want this out of the way so I'm gonna just put it in the microwave for a while and we'll check back on it in a little while for those who want to see what the stretch and fold method looks like I've gotten my hands a little bit of wet a little bit wet and I'm just gonna stretch it and fold it. And it does already feel a lot different from what it was like when I first put it in here. It's still got a little bit of like visual lumpiness, but it doesn't feel lumpy. Stretch and fold. It's got a lot more stretch to it. It's still very soft. All right, and I'm just gonna let it sit a little bit longer. So um, again, this is a step that I don't always do. Um, usually I just let it do a bulk rise for several hours, but this is a an option that you have so that you can kind of see how it's developing. I haven't noticed that it makes a huge difference other than it gives me a clearer idea of when it's gonna be ready for me to shape it. Do another stretch and fold so you can kind of see how it's developed and changed over time. Again, this isn't something I regularly do, but it does give you kind of a nice idea how the dough is performing. And now you can see this is much more like bread dough. This is very much like bread dough. It's soft, it's supple. Let's see, I'm not sure if I could quite make a window pane. It's close to being able to pass a window pane test, but not quite there yet. So again, you're just going to stretch it a little, fold it, stretch it, fold it. Cover it back up, let it rest some more. If you were concerned about its development, you could plan another stretch and fold. But I'm going to let it sit and rise for probably probably close to two hours at this point for its bulk rise. And we're back. It's oh, 20 minutes to three, which is a little later than I meant to go, but you know, I was busy. I got distracted. These things happen. This is life. And I'm going to prepare my pizza peel, which is where my dough does its rise after shaping. Um, I don't use um, parchment paper, but this would be where you could put down your parchment paper if that's something that you do, or if you have the reusable kind. I have a very little bit of reusable parchment and it's in pretty rough shape, so 
And the goal here is to make sure that I get enough flour down that it's not going to stick. Um, I guess sometimes it sticks a little bit. That's the disadvantage with using a pizza peel over parchment. Um, and I end up with slightly odd shaped loaves. But it's not the end of the world. Then I like to throw down a little bit of coarse ground cornmeal. you got to keep this in the refrigerator because... Um, the uh, germ will go rancid otherwise pretty quickly and rancid oils in your corn meal at the bottom of your bread loaf are noticeable and disgusting. So now this is ready, I'm just going to set it out of the way and I want to sprinkle just a tiny bit of flour. I don't want to incorporate a lot of extra new flour into this. Alright, so here's Here's the um, dough as it is now. It has risen quite a bit. Again, you don't expect it to double. I'm gonna flour my hands so it doesn't stick to me too much. Again, you can oil your hands and the surface if you want to. I wanna use a little bit of flour. Poke it. And the fact that it doesn't fill in immediately when I poke it um, means that it's had enough time. The fact that it doesn't deflate and collapse immediately also means I haven't let it rise to sit for too long. Very, very slowly fills in. So, means it is ready to go. Oh, and it's such a soft, nice soft dough here. It's really very well behaved. Some, uh, when I made Anadama bread, that's a very rude dough that sticks everything. Squish out some of those irregular air, air pockets. Your bench knife or scraper or if you've got a spatula, if you don't have a bench knife that's fine, you can use a scraper or a spatula. It's going to really be your friend here because it helps you get the sticky dough up off of the counter. I do know some people will use the bench knife heavily in their shaping process and um, it looks really cool but it's also too hard on my hands so just a little more squishing all right now this abusive kneading and pounding it on the counter that's we're not it's not something we're gonna do now this is a point where some people will pre-shape their um, loaf I don't do that um, it doesn't make sense to me um, I understand vaguely the science behind it um, but I've never needed it I mean I've never needed to do it not you know not needed oh, it oh, ha, ha. Oh, oh but anyway um, I've never found it necessary so I just go ahead and shape it I don't pre-shape it let it rest and then shape it again later I just shape it that's one shaping because when you pre-shape and then you come and squash it around and then shape it again the part that was up is no longer necessarily up and I just, it doesn't make sense to me so all right so i am gonna let it sit here for a moment wants to help. um could you please get her away i don't want her hair in the bread that because that would be gross um i want the bottom where it's you know making a seam to all fuse back together that's part of the advantage of having a wetter softer tackier dough is that it will do that without you having to do a lot of pinching and weird stuff I'm just gonna let it sit here for a few minutes and do that and then I'm gonna put it on the peel cover it up with the, the uh, damp cloth which I'm actually gonna re-moisten because it's a little getting a little dry and then let it rise for let's see it's almost three probably an hour and a half two sure. hours ish As you can see, most of it's collapsed in. There's one little spot here that hasn't. I'll just kind of pinch that. Oh. And I don't really want to set my peel down on top of flour. Right now I'm expanding it a little bit because I don't want it to end up as like a balloon 
there have been several times they've made these cute tiny little boules that are just like little puff balls. If you've ever seen the mushrooms, the puff ball mushrooms, that's what it ends up looking like. All right, and now we just cover it up and let it take a nap. All right, it's been a while. We're getting pretty close to wanting to bake the bread. There it is, looking pretty good. Keep it covered for now. So I am going to preheat my oven to 450. going to put the broiler rack in that usually gets water poured into it so I can steam my crust. And I'm going to throw my baking stone in. Oh, giant baking stone. Now you don't have to have a baking stone to make good bread. A lot of people will bake their bread in a Dutch oven um, or a casserole dish. And which, in which case they may cover it initially because that will provide the steaming process and then uncover it for browning. So uh, don't worry if you don't have a baking stone or a pizza stone, you can use any casserole dish. That'll work too. You just let it rise in that dish um, and then pop it straight into the oven after you slash it. Um, or you can use a Dutch oven. So we're gonna let this Preheat for a bit because we want to make sure the stone is good and hot before we uh, put the bread in. And we wait to slash it until the last minute because that can result in deflating it prematurely. So now I'm ready to score my bread to put it in the put it in the oven, which is preheated. Um, and so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, put flour over the entire thing. So I think of this as my canvas. Even if you're doing just a simple score, you know, consider this your canvas. And it all needs a nice coating of flour. Okay, so scoring my bread is something that I've only recently gotten good at. So um, if you're doing something more artistic, you might find that a piece of uh, baker's twine or string or something is handy for just marking out a map. You're not going to be cutting the bread with this, but you can use it to designate some lines and some spaces so that you can do things evenly. This is easier if you've got something to rotate it on, which I haven't got. Kind of, yeah, it is sort of, because the, you have the, center the, the process for this one in particular is very much like a mandala. This particular design is intended to be symmetrical. Oops, oh, I screwed up. So we're just going to have a little oddness over on this side. This is what happens when people come in and talk to me while I'm working. Okay, I want to score this direction. This direction. I like to use a razor blade rather than a knife. I don't have a lam. Um, I've seen a beautiful lam on Etsy that I would really like. It's this little UFO design when you're slashing your bread you're giving it suggestions of where it should expand your bread is going to need to expand and if you don't slash it it's going to explode somewhere that you didn't want it to <laughs> all right so I'm gonna call that good kind of a neat design despite its little mishap all right, and then I'm going to put this in the oven.
some water. That'll steam. I'm going to check it in about 15 minutes. And uh, once it starts to brown, I'm going to drop the temperature to 350 for the rest of the bake. So my bread is looking pretty good. And to check and see if it's done, it's a really simple test. Take it out, and you're going to tap the bottom. And it should sound hollow. This one sounds hollow, so it's done. And there are two options here. I could take it out and let it cool, or I could turn off the oven and leave it partly open um, for a curing process. You can do this if you want to really set that crispy crust. If I take it out and let it cool, the crust won't be, won't retain its crispiness, but it's still delicious. So kind of your call. Uh, because we're getting dinner ready, I kind of want it to cool so that we can eat it sooner. You can see how the design turned out. Ooh, that looks nice. Pretty. It's like a mandala. Feathers. It is like a mandala. It looks like feathers. I don't like feathers. Or a bunch of wheat stalks. So um, while it's sad but true, you shouldn't cut a hot loaf of bread because um, the, you'll let the steam out of the inside and that'll dry it out. So if you simply cannot resist, because it happens to all of us, I mean, it's hot bread, um, slice off what, you, what you're going to and then set it cut side down on something that's not doesn't have holes. So like a wooden cutting board or a plate because then it will keep that moisture inside and it won't dry out. So, nice little trick for eating hot bread. This Whatever. is what my bread looks Here's like. Your I checked underneath. Look at that. 